Some of you may be asking, wait, this series is called Lost Bands of Yesteryear. Why is there an episode about a solo artist? Well, that's a good question, and the answer to it may surprise you. The fact is that this isn't about a solo artist at all. Alice Cooper, the band, is next up, so stay tuned. We've talked about that fertile, imaginative soil, which sprouted countless interesting bands and new musical directions in the late 1960s, a lot here on the Guitar Historian channel. The band that we are going to examine today is yet another that pushed the boundaries of everything that came before and examined what was possible on stage. As I said in the intro, it can be a little confusing as the man now known as Alice Cooper is usually regarded as a solo artist, but... This persona was born from the band known as Alice Cooper, whose string of hits in the early 70s joined a number of hard rock bands that were pushing the envelope towards a heavier sound and darker themes of songwriting, exploring the macabre side of rock. But before we get started, please remember to subscribe to the Guitar Historian channel for all things classic rock, where you can find our documentary series, If Guitars Could Speak, Forgotten Fretmasters, and this one, Lost Bands of Yesteryear. We talk about the history of bands and musicians, but unfortunately due to YouTube rules, we can't use their music. So I've placed curated links below to watch after this video. We're on a march to 100,000 subscribers, so please join our community and be sure to comment below with any memories or questions you may have. And now, back to Alice. Back to that fertile ground that we were talking about. So many interesting bands. Could they all play an instrument? Who cares? But it seemed that being in a band was a necessity of many young teens who found themselves on the cusp of adulthood thirsty for the fame and notoriety of their unquestioned idols, the Beatles. This spirit reached as far as the deserts of the American West to Phoenix, Arizona, and a school known as Cortez High School, which is actually still around today. It was 1964, the height of Beatlemania, and a then 16-year-old cross-country runner named Vincent Fernier was focused on participating in the Letterman's talent show. Of course, the only way to go in was as a band, and so he gathered his fellow runners to dress up in beetle wigs and suits and hit the stage. Of Fernier's four mates, Glenn Buxton, Dennis Dunaway, John Tatum, and John Spear, only two played an instrument. Buxton and Tatum both played guitar, so they mimed while the others mimed to a rewritten version of Please Please Me, in which Vince would sing, quote, Last night I ran four laps for my coach. The act was the toast of Cortez and ended up winning the talent show. This early taste of success led the eager Vince Vernier to talk the rest of the fake band to actually give the music thing a go. And so over the next few months, they would acquire instruments at a local pawn shop with Glenn Buxton teaching the rest of the fledgling musicians and slowly working up their cover song repertoire. Eventually, the new band would take the name The Spiders, with Vince on lead vocals, Buxton and Tatum on guitars, Dunaway on bass, and John Spear taking the drums. They would play songs by The Beatles, The Stones, The Kinks, The Yardbirds, and The Who, among many others, and set out to play a number of local shows. The band would play in front of a massive spider's web backdrop, the stage prop being a harbinger of what was to come in the band's not-so-far future. Fernier would later say of his guitarist and friend Glenn Buxton, quote, Glenn ended up being one of the great rock guitar players of all time. He created Schools Out. He created all that stuff. Glenn was not a songwriter. He would write riffs, though. They would show up on the album, and even great guitar players would say, What is that line? It's so weird, but it's catchy. So Glenn was always sort of our icing on the cake. By 1965, the Spiders had recorded and produced their first local single, featuring two covers, with the A-sides, Why Don't You Love Me, which was a Blackwell's hit previously, and the Marvin Gaye Tamla tune Hitchhike as the B-side. Vince would learn the harmonica for the record. By this time, the band was a well-known local garage band, having secured a residency at a local club, The VIP, and supporting such touring acts as The Lovin' Spoonful, The Yardbirds, Them, The Animals, and The Birds, 
And by mid-1966, the band was already a practiced hand of the live circuit, and the members were graduating from Cortez. John Tatum decided to exit for a more respectable career to be replaced by North High graduate Michael Bruce on rhythm guitar. Shortly thereafter, the Spiders would release a second single, their first original composition called Don't Blow Your Mind, released by a small local label called Santa Cruz Records. The band would shortly swap drummers, and this lineup would remain together for the entire run of the band's recording and touring career. The Spiders began to travel regularly to Los Angeles, California to play shows toward 1967, and with the changing musical landscape from blues based to stripped down rock towards a more psychedelic and adventurous direction, the Spiders decided it was time for an image change as well. They came up with the name The Naz, N A Z, and gradually located permanently to LA, releasing another single, the A side, called Wonder Who's Loving Her Now. The single would become better known for its B-side, Lay Down and Die Goodbye, which would be re-recorded later. This period also saw the band spend time in the California desert shooting rabbits, one time in which Vince accidentally shot his new drummer Neil Smith in the ankle with a 22 rifle. The fragment of which Smith still carries inside of him. They were also the victims of a horrific car wreck in their van, with it rolling over four times. However, miraculously, everyone in the car survived without serious injury. Interestingly, the Naz's path would cross with a then mostly unknown in America English band who was in LA at the same time playing clubs and trying to make a name for themselves in the US. That band was none other than the Sid Barrett fronted Pink Floyd. Years later, the artist formerly known as Vince Vernier remembered, quote, It was back when they ran out of money and they moved in with us. We were playing the same club. We knew who they were, but I don't think anybody on the planet knew who they were. We got along with these guys so well because we were both kind of psychedelic at the time. Sid Barrett and Glenn Buxton got along. They were both two of the weirdest guitar players ever. They came over and stayed, I think, for a weekend with us because they ran out of money. I mean, they literally just ran out of money. The funniest story there was that we did get an audition at Gazari's in the afternoon. Pink Floyd decided to make brownies. Now, I had never ingested marijuana before. It's a different high. I mean, it's like you really get crazy stoned. We were up on the stage trying to do these songs for an audition, and I kept falling off the stage. It was only about a foot high. The Floyd were in the audience. It was just them in the afternoon, and they were laughing their heads off because we were so stoned. But we did get the job. As the calendar rolled on into 1968, the Naz realized that singer and producer Todd Rundgren had a band called the Naz, and so they set about changing their name and image for a third time. Vince's vision for the band was one in which they truly utilized the stage part of the show as an addition and augment to the music. They began to throw names around that had a darker, more supernatural horror sound. One of the finalists was Husky Baby Sandwich, but luckily this was turned aside. Vince would suggest a name that he said, quote, conjured up the image of a little girl with a lollipop in one hand and a butcher knife in the other. Alice Cooper. It was reminiscent of the well-known teenage axe murderer Lizzie Borden and seemed to fit the slightly nefarious yet mysterious image that Vince was going for. Over the years, an urban legend about the band receiving their name from a Ouija board session emerged, but Vince laughed this off as nothing more than a tall tale, saying, quote, It was just pure urban legend. I heard about the witch thing probably the same day as you did, but it was a great story. It was around this point that the singer known as Vince Fernier began to melt away, revealing the persona that Fernier had imagined all along, that of Alice Cooper. Despite the band itself being known by this name, Vince would adopt that name for himself by the time of the release of their first album. But before this, they had to get a record deal. After a particularly reviled set in which most of the audience left after 10 minutes, the band was approached by legendary music manager Shep Gordon, who saw potential in their act and put them in touch with another like-minded outcast of schlock rock, none other than Frank Zappa, who was looking to sign bizarre acts to his new record label, Straight Records. Zappa told the band to be at his home at 7 o'clock for an audition, forgetting to mention whether he meant AM or PM. When the Alice Cooper band showed up on his doorstep at the crack of dawn, Zappa knew they must mean business. Alice later recalled, quote, Frank was the only one who stuck out his neck for us, for me. He was the one who said, here's a band that everybody in the business is laughing at. I like him. He was the outcast in L.A. and so were we. 
Another huge part of the Alice Cooper stage act and persona would come from another Zappa-signed artist. The all-female band the GTOs, whom Zappa asked to dress up Alice Cooper in makeup and female clothing. The image began to cement the band's turn toward the truly bizarre. The band would enter the studio to record their first effort, called Pretties For You, in late 1968 and early 69. According to their manager, Shep Gordon, the album was recorded in less than a day, and Frank Zappa had left his brother in charge of recording the band while he left for the day. When he returned, he declared the album finished and released it as is. The album doesn't feature Alice Cooper's later hard rock sound, this time focusing on a more psychedelic prog rock type of sound with odd time signatures and sound effects, no doubt a nod to their oddball benefactor Zappa. As a result, the album did little in the charts and barely cracked the top 200. They would record a second album called Easy Action in March of 1970, which was much the same as the first and was generally panned by critics as directionless and tuneless. Alice Cooper began to feel that while they believed in their stage show and direction, they may have just been in the wrong state. As leader Alice would say, quote, they were all on the wrong drug for us. They were on acid and we were basically drinking beer. The band would relocate once more to the Midwestern town of Detroit, Michigan, where they found the crowds much more receptive to their signature style of rock. Detroit had been the birthplace of proto-punk with acts like the Stooges and MC5 paving the way. It was also here that they would hook up with producer Bob Ezrin, who would help them can the psychedelic, progressive, meandering sound for a more stripped-down guitar-based rock. Initially, Ezrin took some convincing to eventually work with the band, but he relented after seeing them perform a show at Max's Kansas City, during which audience members participated by singing along and miming to actions from the stage. Alice Cooper would release a single in November of 1970 called I'm 18, and that song would become a surprise top 40 hit early in 71. By this time, Warner Brothers had bought out Zappa's straight records and saw opportunity in Alice Cooper, and so the band's third album would be a much more professional affair and would appear in March of 1971 as Love It to Death. The themes of the album turned much more towards the macabre with stage shows featuring Cooper thrown in a straitjacket for the Ballad of Dwight Fry and a mock electric chair was brought in as an early prop for the first of Alice's many onstage deaths. The album's success would be completely dwarfed by the ensuing tour, however, as the word was out about this Alice Cooper band's particular style of stage show. The tour generated so much revenue, in fact, that the band brought a 42-room mansion from actress Anne Margaret in Connecticut, which they would use as their home base for a number of years. And I'm sure that the neighbors were just thrilled about that. Although Love It to Death garnered mixed reviews, it has remained a stalwart due to its steps towards heavy metal and the hair bands to come in the next decade. Indeed, Joey Ramone, John Lydon of the Sex Pistols, and many grunge artists in the late 80s would all point to Love It to Death as a seminal work in their upbringing. Finally, it seemed to all be coming together for Alice Cooper. They had a producer who was putting them on the right track musically, a stage act which was creating tons of buzz among the ticket-buying public, and hit records that were making the band money. The golden age had begun. Cooper's second album in 1971 would be Killer, which backed up Love It to Death's success with an even higher chart on Billboard with 21. Led by the grinding Under My Wheels, the album would lead to more touring which had barely stopped from the previous album, and more attention from the public, not all of it wanted. Inevitably, it was around this point that more conservative areas and countries began to call for bands to Cooper's stage antics, which of course only tended to fuel more of a desire for the public to see them. In 1972, several members of the UK Parliament called to have the band banned from performing in England, and as a result, their next tour broke box office records there. That same year, Schools Out, with its anthemic title track, would be released and continue to cement Alice Cooper's domination of hard rock. Arguably their best-known track, Schools Out is often the one song that is played as a gateway for beginners to the band's music. It even went to number one in England, the very country that tried to ban them. The Cooper Ezrin machine would pump out their most successful entry in early 1973, the chart-topping opus known as Billion Dollar Babies. 
The album was named in part due to the band's shock at their quick success with Alice saying, quote, how could we, this band that two years ago was living in the Chambers Brothers basement in Watts, be the number one band in the world with people throwing money at us? Led by the hit single, No More Mr. Nice Guy, the album would also feature a gaggle of extra talent in addition to the regular band, which still, even after three name changes and many musical directions, still consisted of Vince Fernier, Glenn Buxton, Michael Bruce, Dennis Dunaway, and Neil Smith. While the ensuing tour would break records and sales, it would not generate the gross profits that the band had hoped. This was based in no small part to the insane amount of money being spent on the ever-increasing stage show that needed to be pushed further and further. The band even hired magician James Randi, who would go on to some fame as a paranormal debunker, to supervise and coordinate the special effects, which at this point included the now ubiquitous guillotine, surgical tables, whips, mirrors, hatchets, a dentist drill, 300 baby dolls, 22,000 sparklers, 58 mannequins, 280 spare light bulbs, 1,000 patches, 14 bubble machines, 28 gallons of bubble juice, and 250,000 packages of bubble bath. <laughs> the insanity of Alice Cooper's stage show was second to none. However, the breakneck pace of writing, recording, and touring was beginning to take its toll on the human members of the band, with original member and guitarist Glenn Buxton often taking the brunt of the emotional baggage. He had developed a dangerous alcohol habit, which led to his quick decline and erratic behavior, even leading to him pulling a switchblade on the band's tour manager. Exhaustion had begun to creep into the edges of the band's musical output and the recording and writing of what would be their last album, November 1973's Muscle of Love, would become an arduous task that most of the band members do not remember fondly. It would be the first album without producer Bob Ezrin, with the official story being that he was recovering from an undisclosed illness, but the band's members remembered that there were arguments over musical direction. As a result, the album would receive mixed reviews despite still reaching number 10 and achieving gold status. One funny story from this album was the band stab at recording a theme song for the upcoming James Bond film, The Man with the Golden Gun. Alice the singer remembered, quote, it was supposed to be the Bond theme, but it actually came in a day too late and by the time they heard it, they'd already signed for Lulu's song. I went, you're gonna take Lulu over this? because it was perfect for the man with the golden gun. It had helicopters, it had machine guns, it had the Pointer Sisters, Ronnie Spector and Liza Minnelli doing background vocals. We went to every single one of those John Barry albums to try and invent the perfect James Bond song. And even Christopher Lee, who played Scaramanga in the movie, said, oh man, why did we take the Lulu song? This song was the one. So yeah, we lost out on that one, but I still put it on the album. I said, I don't care. I'm going to do a James Bond track no matter what. But after seven albums in a little less than four years, millions of records sold and tons of box office success on their tours, at the height of their power, Alice Cooper broke up. It seemed that each of the band members have their own memories as to the reason for the sudden split. Drummer Neil Smith said that the band had intended to take a year off to slow down, work on solo projects, but then simply never reunited. Cooper would later say that the band could not agree on whether to continue with the costly stage shows, but everyone agrees that Glenn Buxton's exit was a big reason for the eventual folding. Going back to the band's original founding for the Letterman's talent show, Buxton was the driving force musically behind the band, and it was clear that everyone else looked up to him. His exit may have left the group somewhat directionless, and so the band would play its last show in Brazil on April 8th, 1974. But I think most of us know what happened next. Vince Vernier would officially take the name Alice Cooper as his legal name and continue on as a solo artist, resurfacing in March 1975 with his first solo album, Welcome to My Nightmare. Despite it seeming strange that the newly christened Alice would be crazy to leave behind a band with which he'd had so much success, the split was mostly amicable. Cooper and producer Bob Ezrin envisioned a new direction in which Alice's full vision of theatricality could be realized. Welcome to My Nightmare, co-written by Cooper, Ezrin, and collaborators Steve Hunter and Dick Wagner, who'd previously worked with Lou Reed, was a concept album that explored themes of mental illness. The album would reach platinum status and the ensuing tour, which featured Alice slaying a cyclops, kept the support band mostly in the shadows while Cooper did his thing. 
Meanwhile, Neil Smith, Dennis Dunaway, and Mike Bruce of the original Alice Cooper band would reform in 1977 under the name Billion Dollar Babies and produce one album, Battle Axe. Through the years, they would also perform with Glenn Buxton as well, but, but Buxton would pass away in 1997 of viral pneumonia. Cooper and his original band would not reunite officially until the second Buxton Memorial Weekend in 1999. They would reunite again with session guitarist Steve the Deacon Hunter filling in for their induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2011, and this would lead Dunaway, Smith, and Bruce to collaborate with Alice once again later that same year on his sequel to his first solo album, Welcome to My Nightmare. They have continued to reunite throughout the years, even for a small UK tour in 2017, and Bob Ezrin has hinted that another may be in the works. Alice himself has stayed busy, and he just celebrated his 75th birthday back in February. He has released over 20 solo albums and has toured consistently every year since 1968. Between his solo career and his supergroup, The Hollywood Vampires, that he formed with actor Johnny Depp and Aerosmith guitarist Joe Perry, the man is always on the go. These habits were formed way back in 1965 when once the hardest working band in Arizona and the Spiders would morph into one of the biggest bands and best selling acts of the early half of the 70s. The Alice Cooper band is looked back upon with reverence by many in the hard rock genre who see the band as a huge influence on both their musical sound and their stage presence and live show. They explored what was possible in a rock show and when they couldn't find anyone else doing it, they just invented it themselves. But that's another episode of Lost Bands of Yesteryear. Once again, please be sure to join our community by subscribing to the channel and checking out the tons of other content that I have. You can do that by clicking right here, and there's a link to a video you'll like right about here. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.